Rallycross Conversations, chatting all things dogs and running. Join me, Michelle. Me, Louise, as we chat to guests and experts about dogs and running, sometimes whilst we are out running. Welcome, everybody, to today's Canny Cross Conversations. Today, Louise and I are joined by Dominique Armitage Riley, who's a veterinary physiotherapist at Yorkshire Animal Therapy. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dominique. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit more and just tell us what it what it is exactly that you do and how you came to specialise in veterinary physiotherapy. Yes, well, thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, my well, my sister and I started Yorkshire Animal Therapy in 2015. Um, and what the idea of it was is because my sister's a McTimony chiropractor um, for animals, um, is that me being the veterinary physiotherapist and her being a McTimony chiropractor, we could work together to provide a sort of a holistic service for dogs and horses in the area, um, Yorkshire area. Um, we're based in Harrogate, but we do cover most of Yorkshire. Um, so how I qualified, um, I'm a veterinary physiotherapist. So I did a BSc at the Royal Veterinary College um, in London, um, which is a bit like the first couple of years of the veterinary medicine course, because uh, I wanted to be a vet, <laughs> like most girls who have horses or dogs want to. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't get onto the course. Um, so I did the BSc and then went into work um, actually a horse hydrotherapy spa um, and that's where I saw um, a McTimony chiropractor doing his job and he was sort of the one who got me into thinking I wanted to do something similar because um, you're self-employed um, and you get to work with animals all shapes and sizes so um, I did a course at Harper Adams University um, a postgraduate diploma and qualified in 2016 so being qualified five years um, and me and my sister refer cases to each other. Um, I probably actually now mainly treat dogs, um, which is not really what I thought I was going to do, being a horsey person. <laughs> um, but I actually prefer it. Um, I get quite a lot from it. Um, and yeah, my sister probably mainly treats horses, really. So we, we work quite well together. I've heard of um, a, a client I used to work for had horses and he had a mid-timid, mid I can't even say it. <laughs> and uh, he swore by it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. What I, I mean, we talked slightly off air beforehand and I am really interested because I thought um, people that worked physio on animals were human physios, but you've just told me differently. So there is there are two qualifications now yeah there is actually also now the ability to go straight from school into a veterinary physiotherapist course um you can actually do a bsc at harper adams university which is a four-year course um and the fourth year ends up being mainly placement um but yeah you can do bsc as a um veterinary physiotherapist as well um, that's amazing i wish we had all these choices when we were younger <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we it want. is a good alternative to being a vet um just knowing my friends when I was at, from the Royal Veterinary College who've gone into veterinary it's much less my job is much less stressful <laughs> and I uh, definitely got more work-life balance um than they have so I think it went the right way so you talked about that you mainly do dogs now. Um, why might someone need um, physiotherapy for their dog and how can it help it? Um, so most clients come to me uh, because their dog's got some sort of musculoskeletal problem. Um, but actually, in reality, any dog can see me for physio, whether they've got a problem or not. And I'd prefer to see them before they've got a problem. <laughs> Because I can sort it out because, well, especially if they're doing something like canny cross or any sort of um, higher risk sport rather than just your average go walking. Um, you'd be surprised how many um, have like muscle imbalances or something or even actually have low grade lameness. And the owner doesn't necessarily know that's what they are currently like. Um, what I'd quite like to do with 
my job, especially now I'm in a veterinary practice, I've got a clinic in a veterinary practice, is do a bit more sort of owner education um, as to how to, you know, know what's normal for your dog and um, what sort of things they can be looking out for um, to help basically long term care. Because actually, um, we can't do, I mean, I, I'm a, a Pilates teacher and a personal trainer, so I know about sort of balance, you know, you, you need to work on your body to keep us strong, to keep us running and things like that. But we can't, we can't keep our dogs, but how do we keep our dogs balanced if they have got an imbalance? I think is what I'm trying to say, because we can't do strict training with them, can we? You can't get them together. Well, up. you can actually. So oh, that's okay. the, so um, it was interesting listening to that previous podcast. Um, was it Georgia who um because she was talking about what strength training or cross training she does and you can actually do exactly the same for your dog if you have someone teaching you how to do it um so physio isn't just doing say massage or stretching range of motion and um, quite a lot of what I do as well is teaching the owners how to do specific exercises to target muscle groups so say if you've got a particularly weak leg or they um have got a sore back is to strengthen their core or that that particular muscle with specific exercises um and so like the most common one i'd say i probably do is like a sit to stand and if you do it in a controlled way um a sit to stand is very similar to a human squat so it works wow. quite. That's fascinating, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Wow. So are these exercises? Are these the sorts of things we can, other things we can do at home with our dogs, or is this something you would recommend seeing a physiotherapist like you about? So I. So the only reason I would say see a physio first is because you want to first identify what you'd like to target. Um, but also to help rule out any issues. Um, any veterinary physiotherapist anyway has to get veterinary consent first. Um, that's the law uh, in this country. Um, and that's sort of how I work as well. But um, yeah, you need to sort of kind of rule out that there's an issue in the first place. Uh, or if there is, then you can do the exercises and target that specifically. Um, but what I do between appointments is then give the owners homework as such. So we give them like a four week plan where we progress the exercises. Um, and if I've taught them how to do them um, and I know that the dog can do them as well, then it works quite well. This is all assuming that you've got a well, well controlled dog and that will do as you say, because I was just thinking about that. I, I mean, I. <laughs> well, I get lots of different dogs, to be honest. So they. I just do what their capabilities are. So, um, I mean, some dogs won't sit, so I can't do that exercise. Um, but then I can do other things. Um, so there's like one called parastanding where you get them to stand on three legs by holding one of their legs up. Um, and that uses their core muscles, but then also puts weight on the other three legs, obviously. So it gets them to strengthen those muscles. Um, most people do that when they're washing their dog's paws so um it's basically trying to incorporate things into their like daily routine that they actually probably normally do anyway um because it also makes owners more compliant if it's not something that's extra that they have to do yeah that makes sense yeah they're not having to kind of teach the dog anything new really are they yeah <laughs> Um, do you, do you, sorry I was going to just ask carrying on from that do you ever use because I've seen things do you ever use balance pads for the dogs to stand on yes oh you yes, do I do um but I don't so I lend out equipment if I think it's necessary for the owner to have it but to be honest you can use a lot of different things that you've probably got at home so um to do any sort of unstable surface work um I mean some owners will have um like yoga blocks and things like that but you could just use a hot water bottle with hot uh, with water in that's an unstable surface um you can use a sofa cushion or there's all sorts of different things that you can use and when I'm getting them to do like cavalettis uh where they've got to walk over them 
you can use like garden canes and things like that. So I try not to get people to have to buy things. Um, just try and get sort of an idea as to what they could use that they've already got at home. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. I, re I really I really like that. So if we if we as uh, owners, um, I'm just thinking. Like I've been out for a run with Pickle State, and it's an uneven surface because we go over the trails and we went up a very muddy track today. Um, but do we? How do we tell? Do we? Do we? Can we tell if they've got a muscle imbalance? What sort of things are we looking at? Um, you, the easiest way to tell for muscle imbalance is to actually feel them. Um, so when I've got a consult, I'll try and get the owners to feel what I'm feeling. Um, the easiest way is to use your hands, but you that is really practice. So obviously, I did a postgraduate course, which like two years of touching dogs and horses to get the feel right. It's quite difficult, obviously, to expect an owner. Um, but rather than say noticing muscle imbalance, you could maybe notice uh, behavioural changes are usually the most common thing that an owner would come to me with if they haven't got a diagnosis. So it would be things like um, they're not wanting to jump in the car anymore, or um, if it was an agility dog, they've started knocking poles when they wouldn't do that normally um a canny cross dog may be um pulling to one side or starting to bunny hop behind um rather than doing a good sort of even gallop pace it's really getting people to look at their dogs in a slightly different way and to actually concentrate on how they're moving um but also sort of noticing their day-to-day -day things like when they're just getting up from lying down, are they stiff? Um, and sort of, yeah, just the whole picture, just getting them to look a bit more as to what they're actually doing in a day-to-day -day life. Yeah, it, it does. It comes down to experience and knowing your dog, doesn't it? Like such a lot of things. Um, I did have a question for you from one of our podcast followers, actually, who just wanted to know how, how do we know if a dog is just feeling tired on a run, if we've just overdone it on that particular run, as opposed to it's picked up some kind of injury? Would there necessarily be a difference there? Yeah, so that would come down as to how well you know your dog. Um, one of my clients is a canny crosser. She actually has a, got a, quite a good method um, when she's canny crossing. She actually creates a spreadsheet for her dogs. So she knows what they have done. Um, and what she's planning on doing with them. And then she also makes notes as to how they've been on each run so that she knows what's their normal, as, as in how quickly they usually recover or if they she's up the distance, um, whether they struggled that day, but then it'll mean the next day she'll do a bit less. It's quite a good way of um, sort of monitoring it, but also getting to know what your dog's normal is um does that answer the question yeah I think it yeah. does yeah that's that's super organized by the way I'm really impressed I know she's spreadsheet. one of my favorite clients <laughs> <laughs> because it's just like oh so what have they done today and she's like here <laughs> and it's just and also oh, she does amazing. videos as well so I can see what they're doing when they're actually out kind of crossing um so I can see how they're running um, and if it's different to what I've seen before or whatever. Do I have enough problems <laughs> with my own fitness, let alone worry about my dog? <laughs> I think I slow my dog down too much, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> so what, what kinds of injuries do you normally see in canny crossing dogs then? Do you treat a lot of dogs who do canny cross? I do, but um, most of the ones is for, I do currently is more like a maintenance. So it's a um it's unusual in actually because it's more of a um trying to avoid injury rather than reacting to injury um but the sort of things that I see in like agility dogs as well is like cruciate injuries so either sprains or even rupture um iliopsoas strain so that's the medial thigh muscle it's quite common in dogs that do um running or jumping um especially if they're not got the best warm-up or cool down routine and then 
uh, arthritis it's one of the most common things I see obviously that's generally that's in later life but uh, to be honest I'm seeing more and more where the dogs are younger um even as young as you know less than one with arthritis so wow. is that so we had a really interesting chat with um Caroline uh, Dr Caroline Taylor last week um and she was talking about which which we were both fascinated by weren't we she was talking yeah. about the fact that um if your dog's not neutered then the growth plates you know um come together quicker than if a dog is neutered so and we recommend depending on the size of the dog we recommend canny cross starts at a year to 18 months but you know michelle and i are thinking now whoa this needs to be um uh a lot longer and and is and do you think that sort of thing is happening because people are running their dogs or doing too much with their dogs too soon yeah because i i do think um I mean, they have the general rule, don't they, about you do the five minutes per month, which really is not based on any research. It's sort of made an old wives tale as such. <laughs> um, but it basically, it usually gets to about a year and then uh, they then they basically just do what the owner ever wants to do. So whether it be canny crossing or agility or like a year seems to be a, a strange choice of type I mean I would ideally say two years but um yeah that's in an ideal world or um that they see a physio sort of in between that time or even you know sort of eight months plus so you can start doing some conditioning work to uh, lead up to starting to do like your couch to 5k type running uh, so that you've got the core strength to be able to do that so do you think they're quite a couch 5k is almost a must for most dogs coming in whatever age coming into canny cross just to get their fitness off because i think we assume that dogs run around all the time that they're going to be able to their fitness is going to be all right but actually they're not constantly running are they whereas they are when they're canny crossing yeah it's not uh, necessarily just for fitness levels either just for cardiovascular for their musculoskeletal system to adapt to running um i mean most dogs are not uh, like you say used to just running it's not um necessarily a natural thing it's just like a sled dog or something who is bred for that purpose if you think what um each breed does it's not necessarily running especially long distances so it's important that you condition them correct and couch to 5k is a fairly good um it gives people sort of rules as to how long you should do it for and also with rests which are important so yeah that's fascinating you mentioned um warm-ups and cool downs there Dominique I'd just like to expand on that a little bit what would you recommend and is it more important this time of year when it's colder as well is it more important to do a warm-up and uh, well I get all of my clients to do a warm-up when they're on a walk <laughs> um <laughs> they, they some of them think I'm crazy um <laughs> but really like every dog should be warmed up before they're allowed off lead um so my warm-up would be consisting of them being on lead for at least sort of five to ten minutes rather than you know going straight out of the door and then they're thrown a ball um you you wouldn't do the same if it was you go and sprint no without warming it's not actually it's no different for a dog and it's fine if you want to risk getting injuries um but if you want to help prevent them then the warm up um and cool down is quite important i'd say um the warm-up doesn't have to be that specific the aim of it really is to increase body temperature um I mean you, you can I sort of try and get people to do similar to whatever it is you're just about to do so get up to the speed you're going to do walking first and then doing a little bit of changing direction because obviously you're not always going in a straight line um, but that helps warm up the ligaments and get the joints moving. And then doing things like sit to stand or down to stand, because um, that targets most of the muscles 
uh, but also gets the joints moving um, and gets the joint fluid um, warm essentially, um, which helps. And then a cool down is, I'd say is quite important, but more so if it was after something like canny cross, um, it would be sort of going sort of five to 10 minutes ideally to get the body temperature back to nearly normal. But then when you get home, um, I'd say sort of doing massage and stretching. One of the important things at this time of year is to make sure that they're warm when you're taking them home. So if you're doing canny crossing at a place like at a woods or something, it's to make sure that they're nice and dry and warm so that you're not traveling them wet and cold because it's essentially like being naked. <laughs> I've, I've, so I've, I was just listening to you there. So I've literally just come back from a canny cross. So I always walk to start with. And my reason for doing it is one, uh, to get myself sort of geared up and going, but also so she can have a sniff and do everything she's want to do. So I need to add a sit at the end of that before we go a couple of times, I think, because I, I, yeah. I really like that. And, and it, it kind of makes sense. Um, I, I then cool down. I always cool down. Again, uh, I started doing that for me. So I'm thinking if I need to do that, she needs to do that to get everything back down to, to normal. I am really, really bad with, I never put my dog in towel, you know, I rub her down, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not that cruel, I do rub her down, but I never put her in these coats or anything like that, she's a black lab, and I've never done it, and I'm just wondering, is this something I should be doing, as you say, for the journey, we do get in the car to go places, but it's not that far. Uh, yeah, I really like the sort of the toweling robes. They're quite um, useful. Because although, I mean, I think some people think that they're um, a bit of a marketing ploy, but really, you wouldn't, you know, be outside. In, you you're probably wearing a coat. Like it's the same thing for your dog. You're not half naked, wet, and then getting in lying in a car. Oh. So. <laughs> no, you're right. I put a coat on after my run today. We we do have one of those toweling robes for Poppy, actually. And they are good because they do really dry them off and you can feel when you take them off that a fur is warm. So they do work. I wonder if mine will let yeah. me put them on, but we'll we'll have to see. Maybe that's her Christmas present. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you can get when different I put it on. types. <laughs> You can get different types. Some of them don't like them when they have to put their front legs into something, but you can get ones that um, like have a belly strap, which are quite good. Um, yeah, that's the thing. They don't have to that. climb into them. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's lots of different ones. But I, I recommend all my clients, especially at this time of year, have some sort of coat on. Um, it's just a preventative. We we all wear coats. We don't go out without one, so it's no different. <laughs> I'm feeling a very bad being a very bad dog mum at the moment. <laughs> oh, no, Not at all. But, but just... We are learning lots, aren't we? About our dogs. Learned loads in this series. I have Brilliant. to say, yeah. we've learned absolutely loads. <laughs> so, um, so you you sort of um, said the injuries that you mainly see if we talk about canis cross dogs. Do you think they, do canny cross dogs not get as injured as much? I know we've talked about it a little bit, but do they not get as injured as much because we are attached to them and we are going a fairly steady pace? I'll have another question after that. It's just come to me. But do you think that's why they don't get as injured? Uh, but it also tends to be that the canny cross owner tends to be a different type of owner. Um, they generally are more in tuned with their dogs so it's not it's it's probably because they're doing controlled exercise so they are on lead I mean I don't like bull chuckers and things like that they just make me cringe um so canny cross is much better because they it's controlled exercise um it's just yeah, I, I don't. I wouldn't necessarily say that they get injured less. Um, I just would say it's a different type of scenario, um, just because it is more controlled rather than, you know, your ball chuck is being thrown. Yeah. So if you you're if doing you're, zero to yeah. a million miles an hour well, after a ball. Well, that that leads nicely into the other question I was going to ask and forgot about. But when we're racing, um, we literally go off at 
like the fastest pace ever because the excitement and everything like that and the countdown and, and things like that. But I do warm her up, but I warm myself up more than I do her and her. she's got a little walk around. And then we do run to the start line because I try and leave it to the last possible minute now that I got that all from Georgie. So, you know, that was, uh, uh, and that really works because then they're not hanging around. But is that, again, it's a really fast pace. I suppose the warm up's really important. Would you, would you suggest anything else to get the dog ready for that? Because literally we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can do explosive runs as part of the warm up. The idea of a warm up is not to get them tired. Um, it's just to increase their body temperature and warm the muscles up. But I also, it's, it's also for agility dogs. I get them to do what they'd be doing anyway. So if you are going fast in the first, you know, five, 10 minutes, then you need to be doing some of that so that you, the dogs are already in like warmed up in that respect um so explosive runs are quite good so like um getting them to sit or stand and then coming getting them to come to you um you know sort of 50 meters away if you can do that in some sort of area um those are quite good explosive runs um but also doing um like a down to run that's quite good as well but that it that depends on what your dog is like uh training wise as and also what their state of mental ability is at that point when they know what they're going to be doing so it's it's easier said than sort of done it depends what they're what they're like yeah, so we're laughing because we know what our dogs are like. Yeah, there's no way Poppy would lie down when she knew she was about to do a fast run. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's just about doing what your dog is capable of at that moment, isn't it? Yeah. And just just about strength training, because you because obviously the sit and the down is working the core and stuff like that. So I've heard people say that they um, that when they're canny crossing, that they do to get the dog stronger, they lean back. So we've we're taking the weight, and so the dog's got to pull more. Is is that something you'd recommend? You know, she's not looking happy about that. <laughs> is that something you recommend? Or? There's best. There's better ways of doing it. <laughs> Tell us more. The reason why I'm not too sure about getting them to pull more is because it will strengthen their forelimbs, and really, you want them to push off better with their hind end and core. Um. So there's better ways of doing it strength wise so you can do um you can do like a sit to stand with like a raised the front feet raised on something and then doing a sit to stand in that way but it sort of you have to graduate to that so you can't do that sort of thing straight away because it would be too much but there's lots of different things that you can do to get them using their hind end and core better without pulling yeah, pulling is not the best idea because you're altering how they should normally move. Um, and ideally, you want to get them to push off their back, the hind end and work through their core rather than pulling. So a lot of sorry, I've, I've just I'm, <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. So a lot of um, canny cross dogs are actual strong pullers. So we actually need to do this, don't we, to balance. So we might potentially have an imbalanced dog already because we've got... We probably have, if they, especially if they're used to pulling. Yeah. Uh, because they'll just automatically... It becomes easier then for them to pull. So then their hind end gets even weaker because they're not using it as much. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. So if we're serious about our canny crossing, then we should be seeing someone like you. Yes. <laughs> So if you're if, in culture, I can tell you where to find. So if you want to find someone in your area, um, there's the ramp register, um, R A M P, um, and that's a list of osteopaths, physios, um, chiropractors that have done the correct um, sort of postgraduate level training and have got insurance and have done the right amount of CPD. And that's renewed per year. So it's the ramp register. That's a good place to go if you want. And you can also search your postcode and find someone in your area. 
Oh, that's great. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. So how would the process normally go? Would we contact somebody like yourself first or would we have to go through our vets? Uh, so I'd usually say contact them first because yeah. um, if it was me, so I um, send the consent form for you. Um, uh, okay. Just because you can have like an in- initial chat about whether it would be suitable for you or not. Um And to be honest, the rules have slightly changed. So for maintenance appointments, you don't need veterinary consent. Um, But I still get it all the time anyway, because I think it's important to be part of the team and that the vets know what is who's involved in the looking after the dog. So, yeah, I agree. It's all on the dog's notes, then, I guess, at the vet as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Michelle, have you got any other questions that you got from from podcast listeners? Um, I, I just wanted to ask one specifically about running this time of year, particularly when the weather gets a lot colder, when it gets to minus temperatures. You know, is it because this is typically canny cross season for us over the autumn and winter? Is there a point when the weather gets too cold when we can't warm the dogs up enough, or are, are we generally okay? to kind of continue running I didn't know whether it was dangerous or would potentially cause well no issues. what you could do is they could have a if it was particularly cold they could have their rug on while you're warming them up yeah um but if you don't have a rug you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> I think this I think there's one going on Louise's Christmas car, uh, Christmas gift list, there, for pickle <laughs> uh, but that would help because yeah. they'd already be warm um so you're not starting off sort of on the back foot um but now I wouldn't say the the most the thing that I'd be more concerned about is how cold the ground was was for their feet. Yeah. Um, but not in a muscle sense. You'd no, definitely no. be able to get them warm enough if they were wearing a coat to start off with. Yeah, and as long as we're doing our, our warm up as we should be, then that's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Is there anything um, that we should be aware of their feet, like muscles and stuff like that? And especially when it gets cold or just, I mean, I, uh, their feet are very different from us. Well, their paws, sorry, are very different from us. But is it an area that we should be thinking about as well, even when we're toweling them down and manip- you know, massaging them sort of as we're rubbing them down or things like that? Uh, well, it's again, so knowing what your dog's normal is, I do see quite a few dogs with um hyperextension injuries and that's when the paws go much flatter um and that is exacerbated by exercise um and it's quite hard to reverse without some sort of brace um, and controlled exercise um so it's really just getting your dog used to having their paws touch for a start I mean, nail health is also really important because if they've got long nails, um, it's not so much when they'd be on like a soft terrain, it'd be a problem. But if they're on tarmac, um, it affects how they put their toes down. So that can not necessarily put pressure on their joints and and that can sort of then work its way up to the shoulder. Um, So yeah nail health is really important but that's um yeah that's sort of general care for your dog really yeah there's yeah there's lots to think about there thanks Dominique is, is there anything else for you Louise I think I think you've answered all my questions no I think you have and I don't know if there's anything else Dominique that you you think we've not covered that um you know would be useful for canny crossers um well, no, it was really just to try and get across that um, if you as a human are doing, you know, warming up and or cross training, um, that you can do similar for your dog. Um, and especially if you're competing, it'll definitely make you much like more likely to win. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, just general, it's, it's a good, even if you don't think there's a problem, I just would say that it's worth checking in with somebody. I try and keep all the clients that I have that do sort of competing or high level sport on sort of like a three month, every three months check. Um, But to be honest, they are all fairly good at knowing when something's not quite right and contacting me. But um, 
it just means that it's less likely for things to happen. Brilliant. Well, no, that's that's really important. I think we've both learned so much today um, about it. So thank you so much, Dominique, for your time. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you? Are you on social media at all? Or? Uh, yep. So I have um, all the usual Facebook, um, Instagram, and I've got a website as well. Um, yeah, if you want I put most of my stuff probably on Instagram. So, um, what are you, what are you, what are you on Instagram? Uh, it's at Yorkshire Animal Therapy. Fantastic. Well, we'll put it all in the show notes um, below. This is the last episode of the current series, all about different types of dogs who can canny cross and how to best look after them. And we'll be back in January with our season three. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Canny Cross Conversations. We hope you've enjoyed it. And thanks again to Dominique. Uh, please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode and do leave us a review if you've enjoyed this. Thank you.